Hello. In this episode, we begin our study of chapter 11, broadly examining the role of state, market, and civil society in economic development. In the first couple episodes, we'll be looking in particular at potential roles of government, but also their limitations. We can begin by thinking about this in a traditional sort of Venn diagram framework. We have government or the state, the private sector, and civil society or NGOs. And we'll consider each of these in turn. Here we see there are overlaps in activities as well as functions. Later on, we're going to see that when one of the sectors is not functioning very well, the other sectors may, in some sense, take up some of the slack and work in areas that are more natural ones for organizational comparative advantage of the other sectors. Starting with the role of the state, development planning has been one of the hallmarks of the process of economic development and the role that government has played in it. Development planning involves resource mobilization in part for public investment that is a necessary complement, it's understood, to various types of private investment in order to achieve the kinds of transformation that we associate with a development of an economy. And so development planning is in part policy or a system of policies to regulate or even control in some cases the private economy activity according to some defined social objectives, which are the outcome of some kind of political process and are implemented by government. We think of the planning mystique as having been the idea in the early years or decades even after independence as developing countries got economic development, modern economic development underway, that there'd be no doubt about the importance and usefulness of general national economic plans. However, there was some disappointing performance for in many of these cases, some disillusionment about the role of development planning certainly set in. On the other hand, a comprehensive development policy framework is understood to have a real possibility of playing an important role in accelerating growth, and reducing poverty, and more generally achieving economic development objectives in the broader way we think about it in this text and course. And so with respect to its rationale, why would we have such development planning? So in, first, in the first case, it's a response to large-scale market failures. One can have more limited policy responses to smaller market failures. So we have some particular response, a particular agency, for example, is set up to address environmental problems or to address credit failures, financial market failures, and so on. But in part, we're thinking about the large-scale market failures as well the kinds that can keep economic development from being successful, in some cases, even really getting off the ground in a sustained way to begin with the kinds of problems that we talked about back in chapter four. So resource mobilization and allocation, the idea is that markets are extremely efficient, but within some range of existing markets and existing possibilities. In many cases, transformation is not something that markets do very well, in developing countries at least in particular. And so doing so may require a lot of mobilization of resources in comparison to what's really available in the economy and careful thought about their allocation. There's also an attitudinal or psychological impact that's often talked about. And the clearest case about this relates to countries that become independent um, they have been formed out of uh, multiple ethnic groups, multiple um, identity groups of different kinds, such as different uh, regions, clans, and so on. And so having a development plan for the country, say, for example, the country of Kenya, is also something for people to rally around, a point of reference um, that also can help coordinate actions, it's hoped. And finally, perhaps most persuasively of all, it's a requirement to receive foreign aid so that if you want to receive foreign aid, you've had to present a development plan. In particular, how are you going to use the money? 
And what overall strategy does that fit into? With respect to market failure, we can think of three general forms of market failure. The first is that the market just can't function properly or no market exists at all. And we've seen some cases of this in the textbook in our discussions so far. A good example, it has to do with getting economic development underway in the first place, addressing large-scale coordination failures. This is a good example, and it's examined in Chapter 4. Or when we looked at agriculture and development much more recently in the textbook, we saw that markets don't necessarily spring into existence on their own, that they may need policy to do so. The next possibility is that the market does exist, but implies inefficient resource allocation. And we can see some of this in examples from environment, so that there can, of course, be large-scale um, environmental um, problems, but there can be medium-scale environmental problems in which the market does exist, but there is pollution that needs some kind of policy um, response. So that's a second category. Some um, excessive market power might be another such example. Third, and more expansively than the others, the market produces some undesirable results as measured by social objectives, which clearly come out of some kind of political process, um, that are other than the simple basic allocation of resources on their own or by themselves. So matters such as a more equal income distribution or attacking poverty, ending poverty. Um, other things also called merit goods, such as health, that some societies de deem to be an essential thing to provide for um, everyone. These are sometimes treated as separate rationales for development policy or economic policy in particular, and outside the immediate realm of economic efficiency. Although, of course, health care and ending poverty and inequality can all um, have some effect on growth. And so, building on what we talked about in Chapter 10, we can think about a broad typology of market failures. I'll just review this very quickly. <clears throat> They can occur whenever social costs or benefits differ from private costs or benefits, such as we saw in some of the cases examining an environment. Market power, monopsony, monopoly. Public goods, where free riders cannot be excluded except possibly at high cost, which we examined also in Chapter 10. <clears throat> Common property resources, at least in cases where there's a lack of formal or informal regulation um, of the people who live and work with the common property resource in um, um, question. Um, externalities, again, here agents don't have to pay all of the costs of their activities, or if there's a positive externality, they don't receive all the benefits. Prisoner's dilemmas, these occur when agents are better off cooperating with each other than being atomized on their own. However, there's an incentive to defect. The best scenario from the private point of view is for everyone else to cooperate, but you secretly defect in this world. Coordination failures, as we know, occur when coordination is costly. Big push is an example. And finally, it's worth pointing out that capital markets are particularly prone to failures. Um, credit market failures, in which moral hazard and adverse selection problems, economics of information problems, have come to the fore, and this is examined later in the text in chapter 15. So then, in terms of market and government failure, so we have a lot of potential areas for market failures, many different kinds, so there's no question about that. However, in many cases, or most cases, you know, you can have to think about politicians as, and bureaucrats as at least potentially utility maximizers on their own, interested in their own self-interest rather than public interest maximizers. And that makes it a far more difficult problem to think about how government 
can help correct the market failures that are often very pervasive in developing country contexts. So certainly we cannot jump to a conclusion that if economic theory says that policy can fix market failures, then it will do so in practice. And this is, once again, part of the question of balance that we face here. And so an analysis of incentives for government failure also helps guide reform process for developing countries. Civil service reform, providing better incentives for government workers, and also areas such as constitutional design. One major problem is that developing countries tend to have both high amounts of market failure and also high amounts of government failures. But both market and state really play an indispensable, essential role in the process of successful economic development. So we have to work with these sectors as best they can and as best as progress can be made. And so we'll end this episode before looking at details of development planning and roles of the sectors.